please welcome Lawrence Forsley. Well, I want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank the Anthropocene Institute and Carl Page for setting this up. The talk is on electron screened and enhanced nuclear reactions. And uh, I'm here in uh, lieu of my co-author, Dr. Lou Chero. So my outline, go through electron screening, uh, which is denoted as U sub E. It has applications in astrophysics, laboratory astrophysics, terrestrial, Lenner, and lattice confinement fusion, or LCF. Uh, we'll talk about the enhanced screening of the beryllium-7 model system. Look at some density functional theory modeling that we've done a conclusion, and then some acknowledgments. So electron screening. So this was really first discovered in the 1940s. Uh, Saltpeter in 1954 wrote a paper on strong and weak screening. Uh, he talked about strong screening in Fermi degenerate matter where you have on the order of 10 to the 23rd electrons per cubic centimeter. It's what holds up white dwarf stars, so obviously it's got interest in astrophysics. And beryllium-7 is interesting because it's radioactive, undergoes electron capture, but you can modify it by compression, its um, decay rate. And the center of the sun has a density on the order of 150 grams per cc and a pressure of 26 and a half million gigapascals. So it's ripe for changing these parameters. And as a consequence, that will, def that will affect the decay of beryllium-7 in the sun's core. And that in turn affects the boron-8 decay which gives rise to the neutrino flux. Laboratory astrophysics studies, um, accelerator studies, Rolf uh, Zersky, who's here, Hook and others in the 1980s, beginning then, Bazersky and Kitamura in the 2000s, and uh, looking at specifically the gamma factor enhancement that uh, we published in PRC, uh, led by Vlad Pines. And terrestrially, this has an effect in metal conduction bands and in inertial confinement fusion. And on the right-hand side, the lower plot, you can see that experiments diverge from the gamma factor. As the curve drops towards zero, the cross-section is going away. And yet, reported points out to almost 2 keV show that there's an enhancement. So now look at some palladium lattice screening potential calculations. So on the left-hand side, if you have a U sub B e of 310 eV, the bare factor shows that at low energies, in this case below 1 keV, there's essentially no cross-section for fusion reactions. Yet, if you have a screening potential of 310 eV, which has been measured by many authors, you have an enhancement factor of 10 to the 12. Similarly, if you have an enhancement factor of 1900 eV, 1 1.9 keV, then you go and get an enhancement factor of 10 to the 20th. Now, some of the equations for this, the bare cross-section, where E is the kinetic energy, U sub E is the electron screening, both are in keV. We then calculate an enhancement factor given both the gamma factor and the astrophysical factor, and then we come up with an enhanced experimental cross-section. Screening works best below 10 keV, and the nuclear reaction rates are potentially increased by 20 orders of magnitude. So now I want to compare lattice versus deep screening. So we have the potential well between two nuclei. We have what the gamma factor would tell us. And so it's very, very difficult to get around the Coulomb barrier. We can lower that with the electron screening. If we can somehow add additional electrons, then we can increase it, and we call that deep screening. But how do you increase it? So glow discharge or plasma ion sources induce what we call plasma screening, which we wrote about in the PRC paper. But in addition, X-rays and gamma photons induce photoionization and Compton screening, which give rise to additional screening parameters. So we can look at this in terms of gain, uh, looking at an enhanced cross-section versus the thermal power. So we have the cross-section on the left-hand side that you've seen before, running this case all the way up to 3.5 kilovolts. And the specific thermal power versus kinetic energy shows that that will increase as well. But lattice screening is the key parameter for reaction scale-up, at least in our view in our work. It's more effective at lower energies. The material composition, 
microstructures, other physical parameters that have been discussed by other authors at this conference, uh, external fields, maintaining a plasma current, having pulsing, all of these can increase the thermal output. And subsequently, if we can get a cascading set of reactions, we initially did these calculations assuming one set of reactions, not cascading and inducing additional reactions. So I'll now look at the enhanced screening in the Beryllium-7 model system. So first of all, as I said before, it has an astrophysical significance. The decay rate in stellar cores affects the neutrino flux that we observe on Earth. And it's a difficult to prepare thing, but it can be prepared by, for example, the lithium-7 PN reaction, and the beryllium-7 then decays by electron capture. It has a 10.5% probability that the first excited state will emit a 477.6 keV gamma ray photon, which is easy to observe. And what has been observed is consistently a 0.8% reduction in the half-life, which has been modeled with various other DFT calculations, where it's been put inside of a buckyball, fullerene, inside of palladium, or using a diamond anvil. And clearly what this does is it demonstrates a chemical environment interacts with the nucleus. And again, density functional theory can model these reactions. So doing an ab initio, first principles computational lattice design, using DFT, quantum espresso, VAS, VN, 2K, these solve the approximate Schrodinger wave equation in a solid lattice. They provide the complex band structure and the local electron density. They calculate these complex and homogeneous lattices and interfaces. So we can have multi-structures and we can model these. And we can also incorporate external electromagnetic fields. So it allows us to evaluate these complex hydrogen isotope interactions. We can evaluate potential super lattices and other materials, but it has limitations. First of all, the pseudopotentials we use do not exist really above Z4, which is beryllium. Otherwise, we're stuck with the valence electrons. We can't take into account valence uh, core electrons. And now, it could be resolved by additional pseudopotentials but we haven't calculated these, and I'm not where many of these exist for the core electrons. Also, it iterates to a zero degree Kelvin ground state. We're operating at 273 room temperature or higher. Now, this can be resolved by more computationally intensive dynamic calculations. So I'll show some modeling we've done of the beryllium valence and the carbon-60 buckyball valence. So we see here, uh, on the right-hand side, there is the electron density. And you can see that we've got a smeared out over a region. This is just looking at the beryllium 2s2. This is the same thing now looking at a buckyball, where we're looking at a cross-section in the xy plane. But it, both of these are symmetric, so this is true throughout the volume that this occupies. And again, we're only modeling the beryllium and the carbon only. So now I'm going to embed the beryllium, modeling the 2s2 orbital, the outer valence electrons, inside of a buckyball. And what I find is a 1% decrease in the electron cloud volume. And a few years ago when we did this model, we said, well, this is consistent with the compression that you see that gives rise experimentally to a 0.8% reduction. We thought, we've solved the problem. Then we found some pseudopotentials to look at the core electrons of beryllium. We weren't sure we had the whole story. So now looking at the 2s2 as compared with the 1s2 and the 2s2 electron densities. So again, this is with just the outer valence, but we add the inner shell and we find out that we have a much higher electron density at the center. Modeling the entire beast is important. So the higher electron density is calculated at the nucleus, including both, and we need to do that. So now I'm going to embed these. Take the beryllium, embed it inside of the buckyball. What you can't see by eye is we have less compression, but we have a much higher core density of electrons when it's compressed within the buckyball, C60 a 0.1% decrease in electron volume, but again, a much higher beryllium core density. So now I look at the electron densities within the Bohr radius, 
which is the radius of a hydrogen atom, just as a convenience. So we have the beryllium embedded in C60. And you can see the little bright spot in the center for that high electron density. I subtract from that the C60 all by itself, its wave function, nothing else. Then I subtract the beryllium with both shells, and we end up with a 0.1% beryllium compression. Oh, geez, that's 100 times worse than we had before, except we find that we've got a very broad electron density after the subtractions, but it's peaked right at the beryllium core. Broadening that out, the purple line shows you the hydrogen radius, but a close-up shows that this, again, is peaking at 10 times what you would expect. And again, the beryllium nucleus is very small. It's on the order of 10 to the minus 15 meters. So 0.1% compression gives greater than a 10 times higher electron density in the beryllium nucleus, again, consistent with the 0.8% reduction in the half-life. Now, we've applied this to systems that are perhaps more uh, useful to this community, looking at palladium deuterium and palladium deuterium and calcium oxide as a lattice and a super lattice. On the left-hand side, we just show palladium deuteride, where we've invoked superabundant vacancies. We've removed various palladium atoms. The, ratio, the, the distance between them is about four angstroms from hydrogen to hydrogen. You'll notice concentrated where the hydrogen or deuterium are is the highest electron density. We've also done modeling of induced ferromagnetism, where in fact we have an oxygen calcium layer in contact with palladium. We then strain the palladium, induce itinerant ferromagnetism. But again, in both cases, we're just looking at valence electrons. So in conclusion, electron screening has astrophysical and terrestrial implications. It affects stellar evolution, fusion, lattice confinement fusion, and I would observe low energy nuclear reactions. It occurs at high electron densities. Fermi degenerate, 10 to the 23rd electrons per cc. This is not applicable to tokamaks. They're running because of the Greenwald limit on the order of 10 to the 14 to the 10 to the 15 electrons per cc in the plasma, or nine orders of magnitude lower. We already have a step up over what you can do in a tokamak. It occurs at modest energies. It doesn't occur above 10 keV. And what it does is it increases a variety of nuclear interactions and their cross sections that increase further at ever lower energies. It enhances the nuclear reaction rates by several orders of magnitude. And the electron screening can be modeled. So the modeling allows the optimum materials and conditions to be determined. One of the uh, thoughts that Scott Sue has made and others in this conference that we need to be able to model these systems and be able to predict what's happening. The modeling assists in guiding the theory. It assists with guiding additional modeling. And we have feedback through the experiments. This is not a one-way street, and nor is this where theory dictates the experiment. The experiment dictates the theory. So some acknowledgments. This research was conducted under JWK NCRADA with uh, the Naval Surface Warfare Center in Dahlgren. That was low energy nuclear reactions, material design and characterization. Also the NASA Advanced Energy Conversion Project. And we then cut a contract with Dahlgren for condensed matter nuclear reactions. And we had additional support from JWK, GEC, NASA under the Lattice Confinement Fusion Project. And we had additional calculations by Dr. Vlad Pines and Dr. Mariana Pines, both senior uh, theoretical physicists with the NATUS Lattice Confinement Fusion Project and with the Advanced Energy Conversion Project. And sadly, uh, Dr. Mariana Pines passed away this past May. So thank you. Take questions. May I ask the first question? Oh, please. I would be honored to have you ask the question since I, I cite your work, and as you've pointed out, we got it wrong. 
I was here several times and I couldn't ask, so for the first time I can ask you. So thank you very much uh, for a very exciting talk and it is very nice. It's the first time that we really can calculate uh, electron screening effect using some very nice methods. Um, the question is, however, uh, the, you will know that, in, uh, that the electron screening effect is a collective effect. So it, uh, there are many electrons that can contribute. So we know that uh, crystal lattice defects can contribute very strongly to enhancement or to, to electron uh, screening effect as a whole. So the uh, measure for that is um, uh, effective electron mass. So the question is now, uh, can you calculate in your model effective electron mass because from that we can calculate very quickly uh, because this square root for screen energy. Okay, so if you have a effective electron mass, we can calculate really fast uh, the final results we needed. I completely agree and the answer is no, we can't. Mm. And in fact, the codes that we've been working with, primarily uh, quantum espresso and others have worked with VASP, which is the commercial version, we cannot adjust the electron mass. This is a second issue. Mm -hmm. These do not model strongly coupled systems, which is exactly what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. And as a result, there's an awful lot that we cannot model at this time. In fact, I've been looking at some of the work being done at the Perlmutter Institute up in Canada, where they're applying ADS-CFT out of string theory of all things to condense matter as means to deal with these collective effects. And it's not just Lenner, it's superconductivity as well. So I agree with your point, and it is a problem that needs to be resolved, and all it'll take is money. Okay, we will have some money, I hope. <laughs> Thank you. So, Hi, Peter. I see you. <laughs> so we've had, um, years past, we had several efforts to try to get DFT calculations of screening between two deuterons or equivalent two hydrogens and so forth. And between Lou's calculations and Peter Rondo's calculations and Oleg's calcula uh, Olka's calculations and other people's calculations, uh, there was absolutely no sign of enhanced screening in any of the DFT calculations. And when I look in the literature, the DFT calculations, either for molecules or for DT on surfaces or solids, none of them give any enhanced uh, uh, screening between hydrogen atoms or deuterium atoms. So out of curiosity, can you get screening effects between two hydrogen atoms or deuterium atoms? And yeah, the answer is um, Lou has done some modeling to recalculate the gamma factor as a function of this, and that's a work in progress. But again, it misses out as what Conrad is pointing out. There are effects that we can't model. So, you know, this is all a work in progress, and I appreciate all the time you've spent talking to Lou, driving him in that particular direction. It is a limitation, I think, of the code and the basis behind the code, and I, at this point, don't know how to resolve this. Quantum chemistry calculations don't seem to show it either. No one shows it. Other questions? All right, well, thank you all very much.